Yeah, that's really nice. Thank you, Ellie. If you have a Bible, you could turn to Philippians uh, chapter 1. Churches, as you may know, can be a funny, a pretty funny group of people. Uh, churches, uh, kind of like clubs, any club, any group, they can be a little quirky, they can have their own little odd sides, but I think churches are different uh, because they have God on their side. That kind of helps any argument that you have is that you can claim like God status behind you. That's not bad. And so all the more we need, we need to focus always on unity and encouragement, refocusing ourselves on uh, staying on track, and Philippians does that for us. There was a high-profile church in Dallas that uh, kind of having a, an issue. It was a big church, so uh, some major issue, and they actually went to a judge for uh, some guidance. The judge said, this is no place for me. You guys go figure it out yourselves. Well, they all got together, and it didn't go extremely well, and a short time later, actually in the newspaper, to some delight of a reporter, mentioned that mediation traced back to the original source and the issue. And the issue was an elder of the church at a church dinner was served a smaller piece of ham than a child next to him. I know, dreadful, right? I mean, if that doesn't make you mad. Well, those are the jokes of churches. It's they, they split and internally have dissension because of color carpet. That's always the joke. That's the one they always toss out there, the color of carpet. Or it's the minor things. And the argument so often goes that, well, you know, I, you need to be welcomed like, like uh, the local bar, or you need to be welcomed like Cheers, right, where everyone knows your name. And here's a big difference between the church and other clubs and groups, and that is that the church is doing something that Satan absolutely hates. We promote healthy marriages in families. We promote selflessness and giving. We're, the, we're the, literally the seedbed of a community where good things and nonprofits thrive out of the local church, and Satan hates every bit of it. He hates Jesus Christ. And I'm going to say it, he hates your kids, and he hates you. He'll do anything to see destruction here, a local club that maybe early isn't doing much, they do a few good things, but they mostly are just so that people can get together, harmless to the overall scale of things. Karl Bartz, an old writer who said, there are no letters in the New Testament except for the fact that there were problems in the church. You see his point? There are no epistles, no letters or books of the New Testament except for the fact that there was conflict in the church and it needed to be addressed. One way or another, it was conflict that produced and the same thing here in Philippians. And Philippians is intend us to bring us all back to thinking about the main thing. Our weeks are consumed Sports, politics, a great sitcom that you found. You're binge watching it right now. Last night you went through nine episodes and you're going to finish up season one today. And that's good. You know, enjoy. We see all of this go on, but Sundays we come together. This is when we refocus. That's what Philippians was for, to refocus us on the fact that joy is only found in a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. You get these tastes of joy in relationships or in family, and I'll do anything for family, and good for you. Do everything for your family. But that's not where your joy is found. Ultimately, it's found in Jesus Christ. In fact, it goes like this, if you want to know how it fits, is you have a great moment with somebody or a family or doing something that you love, it's pickleball or something that you've picked up and you just love doing it and you're just kind of thriving on it and you're good at sports or 
And you say, this really makes me feel good. Enjoy it. Appreciate it. And then immediately have your mind go to God to be the fulfillment of it because he's giving it to you. He's the one that offered you that. But the joy isn't in that. And thank the Lord for that. Could you imagine if your joy was contingent upon your good health? There are some today that would never have joy be an impossibility because they never have good health or the perfect family or relationships. So if you're a little discouraged, maybe a little downcast in life, you see the craziness that goes on throughout the week. We have this. We have Philippians chapter 2. Take a look and let's read kind of slowly through this Philippians 2, starting in verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection or sympathy, well then complete my joy by being in the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and in one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, through, though, were, was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being the form of likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. I want to mention three things that we have that encourage us. The first one is in verse 1. If you have any encouragement in Christ, comfort for love, participation in the Spirit, affection, sympathy. We have a lot. We have a lot in Jesus Christ. So a lot of things we don't have. Let's start the list, right? A lot of things we don't have, but look what we do have in Jesus Christ. Even though there's conflict and struggles and pain and heartache and oppression, we have encouragement in Christ, comfort from love, participation in the Spirit, affection, and sympathy. I don't know how we can end up divided. I mean, how is that even possible? except we get our eyes off of the main thing. It's incredible what divides a family. Because we have family members that we don't even talk to anymore. We're like, how did we get here? You say, well, because I don't like them. I don't like what they did to me. I don't like what they said. Well, in the family of God, when we join together here as a family... We have encouragement in Christ, comfort from love, participation in the Spirit. We have affection. We have sympathy. We have far more than what we don't have. Be encouraged in our relationship with Christ. God's love is endless. We're inseparable from his love. Paul is very emotionally compelling on this passage, but look to see where he's going. Because he sets it, he doesn't say we have encouragement in Christ, comfort from love. He said, so if there is any, he's appealing to this. Of course we have it. He's appealing if we have any of that at all, if we have any encouragement in Christ at all, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, the same love, the same mind in selfishness, selflessness, and humility. What a privilege we have to be humble, mutually dependent on one another, completed joy. There were there was a great old writer. We probably have never heard of John Broadus was his name. He founded a great seminary in the South. He's just a powerhouse writer and theologian. 
He's buried in this spectacular um, cemetery and tombstone. But for some reason, A.T. Robinson, that's a name that you'll come across if you do some type of religious kind of Bible study reference. A.T. Robinson's quite a powerhouse himself. He actually said, I don't, I don't deserve anything of the attention and acclaim of the John Broadduses of the world. It's kind of his hero. It's possible that A.T. Robinson has contributed more to the Christian faith. And so his request was that I want to be buried in the shadow of him. And today you could visit the cemetery in Louisville, Kentucky, and it's actually true. John Broadus has this spectacular, and it, literally in the shadow of, is a small placard of A.T. Robinson. He goes, that's all I want. I don't want any of this. There is such a correlation between unity, walking with Christ, knowing Christ, and humility. You, you can't separate them. There is no unity without humility. There is no walking with Christ without humility. This room is warm, it's friendly, but we have a lot of opinions. Let's let politics enter in, right? We all have our opinions, we're all quick to share. But there's a humility about the way we exist with one another. There's nothing so foreign to a Christian than arrogance. Yeah, it's tough because we say, yeah, I, okay, I got it. I don't know. This is very, very difficult because the moment that you and I say, oh, I'm there. Fortunately, I'm really humble. Right? I mean, as soon as you say it, and we don't want the false humility to say, oh, no, I'm, just, I'm working at it. No, it, it's there or isn't it? Is the fighting for ourselves, fighting for our own rights. Or there's a humility. And the humility is found in Jesus Christ. There's the example for us. If you look in verse 5, in Christ we have the prime example. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of a man, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. One of the greatest lines that I have read, a writer said, Christ humbled himself. He was not humbled. It made me think, wait a minute. I think I will go through bouts of humility because I've been humbled. But to voluntarily humble yourself, to voluntarily before God's word in the morning submit ourselves to him, his word, and to those we come in contact throughout the day, to do that voluntarily, think about that. Think about the patterns in your own life. I think many of us will look at these seasons of which we were really humble because we were really humbled. Jesus Christ didn't do that. Not because it was forced on him. It's because, in fact, his exaltation was not voluntary. He was exalted by God the Father. He didn't exalt himself. Well, Jesus said it was that way. He who humbles himself will be exalted. But if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. If you take a look at the theology of this short passage, it says he emptied himself. And then it describes that. So you have categories of traits of Jesus, and it can be said in different ways in theology. 
basically the categories are those traits of his that you too can have and you strive for and those traits of his that you can't have. Okay? There are certain things that you can't strive for. Omnipotence. Well, we can try. It's kind of fun trying. Not going to be omnipotent. Omniscient. There are certain traits that are his alone. But then there are traits that he has that we strive for. He is a God of love. And so we, too, want to be a God of love. Now think of traits of God that he could give up, but he'd still be God. Could he give up the trait of love? No, can't do that. What can he give up and still be God? Well, that's the debate of this passage. He emptied himself, becoming a servant. So he, fully God, fully member of the Trinity, gave up certain traits that did not lower him as being less God, but they were all those wonderful traits that he didn't need. Well, when he said, only the Father in heaven knows when the Son returns. That wasn't a game. He'd given up a lot of information. I don't think he knew. Him being limited on certain information didn't make him less God. Did he give up any of his godness? No, he didn't. But he gave up the glory of it. And watch the pattern in which he did it. And there's a lot written on this. It's called the estates or the, you could call them like the steps of humiliation. It's what Jesus Christ went through voluntarily. He took steps from the glory of heaven as the Son of God. He took steps all the way down. Steps of humiliation, the estates of humiliation. And then, once he was at the very bottom, once he was at the bottom, he went through the estates or the steps of exaltation. And that's usually how it's referred to when you see it. So if you just look at this passage, you can see kind of the pattern. He emptied himself. He took the form of a servant. He was born in the likeness of a man found in human form, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He went all the way down. How many of you know the Apostles' Creed? How many of you? I'm not going to make you say it, so you don't have to. How many of you could say it if I, if I did call on you? You could. Good job. Anyone over here? Or are we all Baptist over here? Okay, so our Lutherans and Episcopals are all on this side, apparently. If you look at the theology of the Apostles' Creed, they're the estates of humiliation. It's, I believe, in God, the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord. That's who he is. Now, this is what he did. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. What's next? suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, buried, and then either descended to hell or descended to the grave, bottom. And on the third day, now it's the stairs back up. So these steps of humiliation, you and I speak of it as he humbled himself and he became a man. He would go, well, I wish it were that easy. He goes, you just kind of made it one step. It's not one step. I emptied myself. I laid aside certain traits, certain things that was due me that I am as God, but I voluntarily set them aside because I love you. Took on the form of a servant 
What? Wait a minute. You gave up the God, all this, but you were still God, 100% God, gave up nothing at all that touched his deity, but he gave up that extra. Oh, to be a man, but you were quite a man. You were like the king. No, I was a servant. I was a servant. So you just served. No, it gets worse than that. The likeness of a man found in human form, humbled to becoming obedient to the point of death. Oh, you died. Well, let me just toss this in on a cross. Oh, you did all of that? And then his exaltation was not his exalting of himself. That's a point that's seldom recognized. You think, well, he did it, he earned it, and now he comes out and the music's playing and he's there and it's rocky, and now I made my way. No, he was, he even said, exalt me. Remember what he said after that when he said, exalt me? Exalt me so that I can glorify you, Father. Even in his exaltation, it wasn't about him. It's never been about him because of his character. And this is so difficult for us. So many of you have been abandoned or you have been uh, slighted as a child or in a marriage where if you didn't look out for yourself, nobody, and they took advantage of you. The single mom who had to do everything on their own, and there's nothing greater than a single mom or a single dad that has the career, but also I've got to raise this family, who has no time to be sick. Don't get sick, single parent. We don't have time for that. Because you are always on. And it's hard to assume all of that responsibility and to defend yourself and your family and still separate, fulfill that, but do not exalt yourself. That's tough. You know, that's what kids do to you. You and I really think we're something until we have a kid. I remember hearing um, Schwarzkopf, General Schwarzkopf, speak. Have you ever, had you ever heard him speak? So, and I remember him talking about having command of all the army troops of, in North America. And he's talking about some who were like, wow, you're powerful. He goes, yeah, but I couldn't get the garbage man to put the garbage can back in the same spot every time. I'd argue with him and he threw it. And I'm like, just set it down. And he goes, and my daughter keeps taking my car keys. This is General Schwarzkopf being humbled by kids and the garbage man. And it's because we just elevate ourselves, sim nature, to be something. Striving to be known as something. Striving to be something. And yet the scriptures say, humble yourself. It's as if the scriptures say, I'll do it for you going to hurt. It's painful. I think it was Henry Nowen that said, there's this wonderful joy and freedom of giving up the need of having to get your own way in humility. It doesn't have to be your way because you've let go of that. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, likeness of men, found in human form, humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Then it says in verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him. Therefore God has highly exalted him bestowed on him the name that's above every name, so the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Spectacular. You may be in a conflict right now. You're in a conflict with somebody. Right? It gets to the point where I just want to win. It has nothing to do with the truth of the matter anymore. I'm going to win. It's so hard to separate the pride 
We justify. It's like the survival of our pride. It's all sin. Is ultimately pride. There was a great character, and he was uh, at the turn of the last century. His name's Marshall Taylor. Marshall Taylor, actually his biggest fan was Theodore Roosevelt, actually. Uh, born as a uh, child of slaves, uh, I believe Illinois or Indiana, and he got his hands on a bike and it was unheard of at the time that he would actually be able to, his parents got him a bike. It was just impossible. Well, he would, it'd be like a kid today on the street with a skateboard that does unbelievable things. That's what he ended up doing and a bike shop hired him and said, could you just like do things on your bike out front just to attract attention? And he's like, yeah, I'll give that a go. I'll try that. And there was a 10 mile bike race and the owner said, why don't you just get in that just to promote the bike shop? You probably only make it a couple miles, but at least it'd give me a, you know, a name. And he's like, uh, he's like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. He actually won the race. So start catching on, this kid is, he's known as Major Taylor, Marshall Major Taylor. It's because when he did his tricks, he was in a Civil War uniform. He was never served in the Civil War, but he wore a uniform. In, uh, uh, in New Jersey, there's a street named after him. Uh, maybe it's Massachusetts. It's Wor uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. There's a street named after him. So 1896, he won his first race. By 1901, he was the most famous athlete in the world. This was his claim, and this was a true claim of this guy. I love this photo because he looks just so cool. You somewhere his arms, you could just see how fit this guy was. Apparently just as likable as he was good looking. He was the fastest any human had ever gone in the history of the world. So at the time, it would have been trains. He was faster than trains faster than any runner. He competed all over Europe. He was dominating races across the world. He was literally the fastest human who ever lived at the time. Pretty spectacular. He had a short career, age 32. He finally uh, retired. He was finally impoverished, estranged from his wife. He drove to Chicago and he stayed at a YMCA tried to sell copies of his autobiography. And by the age of 53, Taylor died in a charity ward in Cook County Hospital, Chicago, and buried in an unmarked grave. I'm like, wow. How did, there was a recent Super Bowl commercial by uh, Hennessy Beer. The whole commercial is all about him, him racing. He's a legend. How did that happen? After his death, it was actually the founder of Schwinn Bikes. Schwinn himself purchased a plot, had his body exhumed, and gave him a beautiful burial. And you can visit it today. It's in the Chicago area. You can visit it. Didn't mean a whole lot to Marshall. It was just one last little trip. Didn't mean a thing to him. What in the world, how does that, that whirlwind, the racism he fought was unbelievable. And yet he just kept going, he just kept going. What a hero of a man. Died a pauper literally died with nothing, no family, no friends. How does life do this? 
How does the excitement of the moment, how do we get so captivated where we think we're so incredible, we're so amazing at what we do, but the great thing about God's Word is He humbles us. He keeps us in the state of humility. Your value, your value is not in what you do and what you have done. It'll never be in what you do or what you have done. Your value is in Jesus Christ. You personally loved by God so much that Jesus Christ died as a sacrifice for you. So you can go to heaven? Yeah, yeah, that. Oh, I can have forgiveness of sins. Yeah, keep going. But that's not the point. Keep going. The point is he died for you so that he could have a relationship with you. He wants to be with you. He died for heaven. Yeah, that, I get that too. You died for today. He died for you for today so that you could have value in your relationship with him. There now is the humility. You love me that much? Let me clean up. He goes, no, no, don't clean up. Just come to me exactly the way you are. And you say, no, if you knew the things I was planning, and if you knew what I did last week, I don't think you'd be saying any of that. I think I would be saying it louder. I'd be saying it more forcibly if I knew what you did last week and I knew what you were planning. Because that's why he came. It says you and I need him. And where's the ultimate point of pride? is me and you waking up tomorrow morning thinking we got it all handled. Got my day planned. I'm going to do this. and Maybe I'll throw and read a, a brief devotion. Something. I'll just read something, but it's about me and it's about my family. It's about my job. We launch our day with the pride of which he came to eradicate. No, we open the word in the morning and we say, Heavenly Father, I... I don't deserve to be here, but you love me. He goes, oh, you have no idea. No, I don't think I do. I don't know. I think I, I, think I don't know how much you love me. He goes, just sit here with me. I'll never condemn you. That's all in Jesus. I just want to be with you. I want to talk to you. And as we sit quietly and listen to his word, he softens our heart. And his words penetrate into our mind, down into our heart. And he chips away that pride. Where we get up and we say, my goal today is to serve. That's the perfect marriage, is the guy that wakes up and says, I'm going to outserve my wife today. It may not be a lot of fun, especially if your spouse is not waking up saying, I'm going to outserve my spouse today. If only one of you is playing, it's not as much fun. But Jesus came down and he goes, I humbled myself all the way to the point of death. What, what did I get? What did I get out of this? Oh, I got mocked. <laughs> I got beat up. I had my best friends turn on me. And it's like Jesus says, but it didn't matter. I came to humble myself. They helped me. That's what I came to do. Who won? The one who won was the one who said, I'm going to come humble myself, and they did. And you and I have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. We have the wonderful privilege and honor to humble ourselves. Are any of you reading um, My Utmost for His Highest? Some of you guys? There's free copies still in the lobby, so if you want to grab one on your way out, today's was great. Stubbornness and self-will will always be against Jesus. We are against Jesus 
Whenever we are obstinate and self-willed and set on our own ambitions, every time we stand on our own rights and insist that this is what we intend to do, whenever we rely on our self-respect, it's exactly the devotional today. Remarkable. My prayer is that each of us would live a life of humility because we choose it. Not a life of humility because we're forced into it. Let's pray. With our heads bowed, if you just listen to these words, it's God's words, it's Philippians. Do you have any encouragement in Christ? Any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection or sympathy? Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And here it is, in the quietness of this moment, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also the interests of others. And Heavenly Father, we're offering ourselves in the quietness of this moment to you. We're humbling ourselves before you, asking that you would make us to be a servant to others around us this coming week. In Jesus' name, amen.